Welcome to Watching Silent Films. My name is Yifong, and my co-hosts are Lily and Bob. Greetings. Hello. Hello. Hello, hello. So today we're going to be talking about Three Ages, a 1923 black and white uh, silent from Buster Keaton. We're kind of just <laughs> progressing through Buster Keaton, kind of returning to that until um, until Yifong's library of... Uh, DVDs or Blu-rays of Buster Keaton is exhausted. <laughs> That's what we're doing, you know. I don't know if you're here for that, Bob, that week. But I'm looking at my bookshelf where I'm storing my discs, and I'm like, here's a bunch of stuff that I either have seen before or maybe totally don't remember if I've seen it before, <laughs> which <laughs> happens very often. So, yeah, these movies are I have on disc, I think. So we've Excellent. got a couple of them left. I think um, it, it was a couple of Buster Keaton ones left. I've got, uh, what did I say? It was Our Hospitality is Next. And also okay. Steamboat uh, Bill Jr. And that's pretty much it for Buster Keaton stuff that I'm aware of. Although it could be hidden. Sometimes I have a way of titles I have. Some Sometimes I have a way of resurfacing. <laughs> <laughs> it does seem like there are a lot more Buster Keaton films just looking oh, there online. Are. Oh, there so are. Yeah, many. Yeah. For sure. I just, it was that whole thing, remember I talked about before, I was just going through my library and yeah. figuring out what I want to keep and not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, anyways. Um, so that's what we're doing. We're going through kind of helping me clean up my library. That's ultimately the goal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Very good. Yes. Um, <clears throat> before we get there, you. Either of you had time to check out anything in the classic realm as of late? No. Uh, no, but I, because of watching last week's film, you know, being that it was 1920, I stumbled upon The Mask of Zorro, I think hmm. is the title. It's with... Uh, Douglas Fairbanks? Yes, thank you. Douglas Fairbanks, oh, which is also yes. 1920. So I wanted to watch it, but, you know, the week goes by and it's we already have the next podcast. So I'm like, oh, geez, didn't watch it. But I'm probably well, we going to watch that next. Yeah, we can always pencil it in. Mm. So that's one of the things we talked about. So anytime you, you find something that's interesting, we can always shuffle things around. Uh, Douglas Fairbanks is obviously one of the contemporaries of Buster Keaton. Mm-hmm. And yeah. actually, they have some sort of professional relationship. I mean, these really quote unquote famous people and our people are in power and they're doing work they're often sometimes in studios next to each other or they know of each other through parties and get togethers and sometimes they'll be like hey let's do something and sometimes they have they've talked about it and so that's the interesting part like i i I actually don't remember which movie now but there was a particular title that buster keaton was going to do um that bust the douglas fairbanks was originally interested in doing it, that it turned out like he turned it down and then Buster Keaton took it on it. I don't remember which ones now. Hmm. But I'm sure it'll come to me sometime later. <laughs> so hmm. so that happens all the time, you know? Neat. But um but yeah. How about you, Bob? I uh, nope. Nope. All right. So let's uh keep moving forward then. Let's uh dig into Three Ages by Buster Keaton. I'm going to give a quick plot summary. Um, again, it's 1923. And there are three separate plots in this particular movie. It is one set in prehistoric times, one set in ancient Rome, one set in the Roaring Twenties, and quote-unquote modern times, modern being modern to the era of when the movie came out in the 1920s. <laughs> mm. And so all three films essentially <clears throat> had to do with Buster King being the main character trying to get the girl more or less so is that fair it's kind of yep. the plot of three yep. with the same with the same actors in each storyline exactly yes mm-hmm. playing the same it. positional role yes yes so the reason was that um in case this movie i think it's the first feature film he's directing And because of this responsibility, like he's essentially, we just did uh, a bunch of Buster Keaton shorts. He kind of graduated. A lot of artists do and the film directors of that time would quote unquote graduate from short films into feature films. Hmm. And when you quote unquote graduate, you, um, you take on more risks, you know, feature films. 
And so his way of minimizing the risk is that if this film somehow was taken away from him, uh, he would actually release these three separate shorts as three separate short movies. Hmm. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yep. So he would have one like prehistoric one as a short movie. Ancient Rome is a short movie and the modern time one's a short movie as well. So it's kind of like his own insurance. Hmm. Hmm. So in case he, you know, it flopped, you could break it up and sell it that way. So it's kind of smart if you think about Mm -hmm. it. Yep. And um, it was a satire of the D.W. Griffith's 1916 film Intolerance. No kidding. Yeah. um, And, you know, a lot of comedians like Buster Creighton would often take satires of the did, did intolerance do the same thing with splitting it into three different generations? Yes. So uh-huh. there's multi-story mm-hmm. arc, um, and we chatted about this earlier before we start recording. Or where we, you know, Cloud Atlas is a recent example by the Wachowski mm-hmm. siblings, Tom Hanks and other people. Um, or where you, there are six separate stories in that film, and in you know, so they've been doing this for a long time now. And although we think. If you watch that movie, Claw Atlas, recently, you're like, wow, this is pretty interesting. And, you know, they've been doing it since 1916 and before, <laughs> I'm sure, you know. So it's one, mm-hmm. another one of the situations where, like, quote, unquote, first, I mean, who knows who is first doing these right. multiple narratives in a single film, you know. Very interesting. But, yeah. So, Lily, what'd you, what'd you think of this, uh, about the structure <laughs> itself? but then also about the film itself. Um, well, to start, I had read it wrong when I saw D.W. Griffith. I actually thought, because we were talking about Birth of a Nation, I was thinking it, he was uh, Buster Keat was parodying uh, a Birth of a Nation. <laughs> so I was watching this and like, what? Yeah. What is going on? Who is this? Like, who are they supposed <laughs> to be representing? That like, who's Lillian Bish? <laughs> so... Once I, you know, I reread it and it said intolerance. I was like, oh, duh. <laughs> it's like those but, drinking games, you know, every oh time God. somebody says this, you take a shot. You heard of those, Bob, you know, in general oh, drinking yeah. games? Yes. I would have probably been <laughs> drunk by the time I got to like <laughs> the Roman age. I would have been like, wait, what's going on? I don't get it. <laughs> but uh, it makes sense because I haven't watched intolerance. So I've been wanting to just to be like, because... You know, he's like, oh, so, you know, the idea with intolerance, he's apologizing to the African-American community. But it's like, here's a great movie. I'm still awesome. And so that's <laughs> basically well, it. Technically, well, no. technically, that intolerance movie was more of a, he got, he got a lot of flack for the birth of the nation. But then yeah. he was like, people were intolerant of his racism, more or less. So his movie was actually a treatise on being... Uh, targeted for being labeled uh, mm, a person who is racist. <laughs> well, it's oh, actually boy. the antithesis of what we're thinking. You know, it's like he's unapologetic from there on. Hmm. But anyways, that's hmm. another story for another time. <laughs> we can also slot that in. So just FYI, we can check it out. Yeah, I mean, I, just from the little clips I've seen of it, I know the you know the very first shot is this amazing wide shot, and everyone's like oh, spectacle. But oh, yeah. Hmm. yeah, what I I don't know I. Personally, for me, I didn't really care about this film. I, in my notes, you know, it's the first feature Keaton wrote, directed, produced, and starred in. I'm mean, like, thinking that's really cool. But for me, I just kind of didn't really get in- too invested because it was split the way it was, even though all the characters remain the same and, you know, the outcome was the same to get the woman. I was just like, okay, kind of bored. Hmm. I probably liked the modern age the most like i enjoy when he went to go to the dining hall watching the lady and the guy you know eating so he accidentally gets drunk from a- another table <laughs> who spiked his drink essentially mm-hmm. so he's like <laughs> he's getting a little more kooky but i i mean for everything that we've watched with buster keaton you know it he still had his innovations and his little inventions that were tweaking here and there mm-hmm. within the film. Like I really liked during the Roman age that he took his bucket hat off and made it like a <laughs> boot underneath the wheel of the chariot. I was, was like, okay, that's funny. clever. Yep. <laughs> but 
I don't know. I didn't really even write much that I on my notes that I really cared for or liked to mention for the movie. Mm. Um, another probably well, like even though I enjoyed the modern age the most, I have more notes for the Roman age because it was mm. just seemed a little more crazy and out of character, but. You know, he befriends a lion when he's thrown in its den and ends up giving it a manicure. <laughs> just, I was, that was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. and I think there was somebody in a, a lion's costume. Yeah, it was oh, like yeah. a really cool yeah, yeah. Clearly not really a lion. <laughs> yeah, it was really neat. I liked uh, I like stuff like that where they're either puppets or costumes. So it was, yep. it was pretty cool. I figured, like... There was some kind of fish line moving its tail around from up above, but the rest of it was kind of neat, especially, you know, when it goes to look at its finger, its nail claws, it's like, oh, pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and- for me, not much story I can really mention. There are bits and pieces I liked, but compared to some of the shorts, not, not a fan, you know? Right. And uh, how about you, Bob? I liked it okay. I thought it was clever. I was excited when I saw him as a caveman right in the beginning of the movie. I thought, wow, this is different. This is kind of cool. And riding and standing on the, the head of the dinosaur as it moved along. Mm-hmm. Was, I thought that, that was, was brilliant. Uh, claymation I, I, before, way before motion. Ray Harryhausen. Yeah, I I didn't think... I mean, I must have forgotten because I, I could have sworn I've seen this one before. But that, like, was one of those... I don't know. It must have been expensive back in the day. For the effects, right? Because of Buster being so effects driven, hmm. you know, with all the stunts, um, that must have cost something to make that sort of. I mean, obviously to us it looks super fake now, <laughs> right? With the way they am, you by know, today's standards. Back then, yeah. it must have been like if you were an audience back then, you hadn't seen anything like that. It's like wow, dinosaur coming to life and on a big screen, like. Mm. That must have been quite the spectacle, right? If if you kind of place yourself as an audience back in the day. Um, but otherwise, it's pretty entertaining. It's really short, uh, maybe a few seconds here and there. Uh, but the the stop motion was pretty fantastic, given its time, you know. So, yeah. Mm. So I thought that was fantastic. Go, go on, Bon. Sorry to interrupt. Oh no, that's okay. That was yeah, good observations. Um, I mean, I. I to be honest with you, I, I liked I liked the crossover. I, I, I what really caught my attention was the open in the opening credits when I saw Wallace Berry and Lionel Barrymore were both in the credits for it. Hmm. And I was like stunned, and I was like looking for Lionel. Um, I think Wallace Berry is his arch rival in the film. Yes, yeah, are you referring to? He was also in um, Robin Hood a while ago when we were. Checking out Wa- Wallace Berry. I think so, right? One of the. I Berries. think of Wallace Berry as the father on the Rockford Files. All oh, right, later on, yeah. But I think yeah, he was in Robin exactly. Hood, wasn't he? Let me check. Mm. But keep going. Yeah, that much I wasn't aware of. But um, but anyway, I I I know him as a star, and I like him, so I was very interested, and I and I guessed that that main arch rival was him, but I I kept looking for Lionel Barrymore, and I was like, I I I'm trying to figure out if he was the um, the, the the sage, the old wizard with the with the pointed hat, um, right. but I could but I couldn't lo- I couldn't identify him as Lionel Barrymore, but he was in the credits, so I was pretty impressed. Um. I liked, uh, there were so many things I liked that I thought were very funny, and most of them actually were in the caveman days. I mean, I, I don't know whether, I don't know, he, like he took a, a tor- he took a club and he took a rock and he was playing golf, and he, he I mean, that's the kind of thing he likes to do. And then, um, I, I was shocked at one scene, I thought it was hysterical, but totally non-PC, was this caveman come out, the, 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 the woman was like standing outside and the guy grabs her by the hair and drags her into the cave and I was like what the heck <laughs> oh yeah I was like oh okay never mind PC on this one <laughs> yeah. um, don't worry it's only three years after the uh, woman was you know had the 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 past the voters the ability to vote or something the, <laughs> don't worry <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like don't after. worry <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um 
The other thing I laughed, I, I laughed really hard was near the end of the movie when he came out of the cave with ten kids <laughs> in the in the ancient in the old age, and then when they did the Roman era, they had like five or six kids. Yeah, and then and then in the modern the era, right? And then in the modern yeah. era, they had a dog. <laughs> yep. No, I I totally laughed so much at that. It makes yeah. total sense. So, so there was a lot I enjoyed about it, but I can understand Lily's perspective as well. It um, it, it wasn't as tight. You know, yeah, it as, wasn't as striking for yeah. you know. That's just how I felt. Yeah, some of his stunts were still pretty amazing. I I I loved when he had to. Which era was it? It was, it was the ancient era, when he was. Trying to, when they were comparing him to the other guy for the daughter, for the, the the father wanted to like see which one was stronger, and he hit the guy several times with his club and the arm and the leg and his chest, and he just bonked he bonked Keaton on the head and he like hit the ground like <laughs> like amazing. The, yeah, the way he the did that was Valdeville fall. Yeah, it's that he just well went plop like flat on the ground. It was like wow, you know that that does take some talent. <laughs> It's well practiced. Yep. From the Volleville stage days. But the way he did it, I mean, it's just, believe it or not, I shouldn't have thought it, I shouldn't have found that unexpected, but it did. It caught me by surprise nonetheless. In the context of the film narrative, it was. Yeah. Probably, right? It, I mean, you expect it. I mean, he's, yeah. he's hitting this other guy. He says when he hits Keaton, obviously, he's not going to be able to take it. But I expected him to, like, do the little dizzy thing and fall down but it was like plop <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I had a I had a lot to like it, by the way did you have more thoughts Bob? no 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 that's I, that's pretty much it I had a lot to like about this one I like I said I, I'm pretty sure like I've forgotten more about it than I remembered mm. <laughs> but looking back because um, I've seen a lot of Buster Keaton films uh, I don't think all of them Pretty sure not all of yep. them, but a big chunk of it. Yep. Um, when I was going through his filmography, and uh, and in the past, I used to think you know one week was pretty strong and pretty stellar of all his works, including all of his features, and I'd, I'd rate that one up pretty high up. But one week was only the f- one of the first shorts that he ever made, you know, especially one that he directed. So mm. I don't know. I I I I don't remember that the feature films were being that interesting, like at all. Mm. But either I hadn't seen this, or I must have totally forgotten about this one. I, this one really, I really like this one. And part of it was the actual structure itself, mm. because it's kind of sophisticated for a silent film to have a very multi sort of era period narrative, and for each of those narrative to actually have a point and to actually say something about sort of human nature and sort of you know the the most basics of the human relationship which is just kind of the you know the dating relationship the man and woman and marriage and Mm -hmm. kids sort of the whole family structure right you know the man getting the woman and then sort of the the pursuit the courtship and then also you know getting married and having kids like Mm -hmm. it's pretty basic in terms of storylines for you know any human stories right but he takes that and kind of spreads it across three separate periods and makes it very artistic. I think it makes it, it makes a lot of commentary about how the family has evolved over time. <laughs> mm. <laughs> like bar- back in the, you know, barbarian stages, you know, we around the dinosaurs. It was one thing, you know, he bonked them on the head and you know, the, it's still the father cause it's very, you know, patriarch, patriarchal, patriarchal. How do you pronounce that? Patriarchal. Patriarchal. <laughs> right, right. So it's like, it's the dad, right? You, you need to get the permission from the dad. Right. And then like, uh, Roman is still that way a little bit. Uh, yeah. But I think by the modern era, if you catch this part, the guy was like, and it's up to my wife. <laughs> it's mm. like, oh, my that wife was so funny. That's the ultimate power. <laughs> yeah, that, that was funny, actually. <laughs> like, like little observations about humanity, like... That I, to me, I think puts it over above the average Buster Keaton, you know, affair. Especially like 
like a you know a feature film i think like the one we um did we do a feature one we did one on um sherlock jr right that was also yes. a feature mm-hmm. yep. and it was entertaining it was fun it had some observations but I, I thought that this particular one if you need to compare between the two seems a lot more richer in terms of the actual story and what it, it actually has a lot to say about the family, you know, and how it evolves over time using like the one had yeah, just use the example of. So I thought that to me that like overarching motif from start to finish, like the thing that uh, Bobby just talked about with the number of kids from a lot to yeah, less yeah. and less and less over time. Yeah, I just thought all of that was just hilarious that he could use something that was a comedy, but actually communicate something really serious hmm. for that modern age. It wasn't even for us now. It was for the 20s, right? The roaring 20s. Right. Things were, I mean, this is pre-depression, right? So things right. were generally doing okay. <laughs> the yeah. roaring 20s, right? And they're like, so wow. I, I thought that was pretty um, funny, like the, the, the his observations. Um, now some sp- specific observations for specific scenes, I would say. Um, first thing is like the, like the Roman era... Um, when they're i think they had a chariot race is that correct yep of sorts and the horse i don't know if you guys know this was unequally yoked <laughs> yeah yeah of course it wasn't that horse was it was funny. like some donkeys or something ridiculous. it was like a like pony a, and then a horse animals. and then <laughs> yeah yeah they were all different sizes yeah yeah i mean i'm not an expert in that stuff but like you got to clearly know that they're not, they're not all going to equally pull you the chariot that same in the same way in the race right as you would a horse <laughs> So, and he does that with like he did that before with um the dog sled in um mm-hmm. the frozen north i think right was one yeah. of the shorts where it's, it wasn't even real like husky dogs it was just like <laughs> random house pets <laughs> it was like a dachshund and a, yeah. and a bulldog yeah, all and... Dogs. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's so subtle right like it, if you don't pay attention to those details it would just be over your head so I thought that would like that in of itself is just funny parts. And of course he delivers all that with a straight face, right? Mm-hmm. When he parks the chariot, um, the way so, he so locks, funny. the way he locks the chariot up is just funny. Like it's just yeah, ingenious. That's a, yeah. It sounds yeah, like something like people would do now, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if you had I, a chariot, if, if, if chariots were still in style and I even like the little thing, like the, uh, like there's a soldier, with a sign, and they translate it to "no parking," you know. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. Like, but like I said, funny. like it is funny, but it's also digging at just like modern living, right? Right. Like how over the ages, it just the more things that are different, the more it stays the same, right? Yep. <laughs> and then there was a scene about casting lots. I thought that whole thing was just hilarious. The 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 lots were like it's a dice, right, or something like that. That whatever right. they were using. Just the whole sort of scene and gag about the dice, just any yep. and all of those things. Mm-hmm. Just... Yeah, because it was like all of the the the, the good guys' crew like left him and, wa- and walked over to play the game rather than doing their duty. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, mm-hmm. but what? the mechanical yeah. nature of the dice is just funny. I don't know the way the way is designed, the way they did it. I just thought the whole the whole gag worked for me. I mean, this whole movie did really. Hmm. And and I also noticed something more subtle about like the modern age is a lot of just speed, you know, speed, need, and greed, or something like that. They they wrote in some some of the either the intertitle or some of the messages, and it was talking about where you know it, mm-hmm. in time it used to be slower, right, in mm-hmm. the ancient days, and then it would get faster by the Roman age, and then by the time it gets the modern age, you gotta be super fast, you know, yeah. instant gratification, you know. Well, it, I I always thought it was a funny observation about, you know, cell phones. They were huge when they came out. They were like these boxes. And then they wanted them smaller and smaller and smaller, and they became really small in your hand. And then they wanted them bigger again. Yep. <laughs> yep. They said, that's, okay, we've gone too small. Thing, is this movie is like a similar thing you just said. It makes these observations that are so sharp, you know. That's almost like it wasn't really a comedy. I mean, it is a comedy, but it's also just... Has it's some a comedy serious, with commentary. Yeah, like very mm-hmm. serious social commentaries about things, and that's why yep. like, 
And there's this bit about the whole car falling apart, which is a gag, you know, he's done before and he's kind of yep. bringing it back. And he'll continue, I think, to bring that forward to other feature films as well. Yeah. But in the context of this movie, it's just like, it's good, but it's like, it's also like, you know, nothing lasts forever. <laughs> as modern yeah. as the car is, it falls apart, right? Mm-hmm. And this, and just about that scene itself, when he when he hit that ditch, obviously you saw it coming, but... Oh, yeah. The way he had that car set up so that he was still, he was actually sitting on this pile of rubber. I mean, he had to put it together in such a way that he knew that what he was sitting on was going to be on top. I mean, that's classic Buster in engineering. That's exactly. Classic, yeah. The way he's doing things. Because he was sitting on top of that pile of junk. And I was like, he, you know, I mean, his leg could have got caught in between two pieces of wood. I mean, it was like, yep. but he he came out of it sitting right on top of that pile. And the you, thing also, was a you also wonder how many takes sometimes. Like, how do you uh, have a prop like or a set like that or a prop or whatever you call it fall apart and then if you do a bad oh. take, put it together? <laughs> Didn't you say to me one time yeah. that he he likes to do everything in one take? Oh, he yeah. Like to get it right the that, first time. Yeah, you you. That's why there's no cuts with these special yeah. effects. Yeah. He always just like, you know, single shot. But a, Go ahead. But that but that came back to me when I watched the scene where he was jumping from one building to the other and he mm. and he landed on the awnings and went through them like oh, yeah. was that really from that height what i was uh, thinking no that's a that's a yeah. special effect yeah yeah oh, okay. i was gonna say uh i think it's the harold lloyd scene where he's on the clock tower and they yes. kind of made a large scale miniature yes. that's what right. i thought he was on well so this is what happens right in uh I want to say Alley. I, I forgot which California town I was making movies. It's near Hollywood. <laughs> Whichever town it is, or city, rather. Mm-hmm. There's this specific set of buildings, okay? So let's say in the background you had this cityscape, right, of, you know, people going and coming, and it's like, the, like a, it, it, you know, high-rises, right? Cityscape. You can just see it. And then there's these series of buildings in the foreground, which are also high-rises, and they're really tall. So they, they go on the roof of these uh, tall buildings, right? And then they build uh, a bunch of contraptions for these visual gags. So they would build like two or three separate sort of walls on top of that. So he's not falling, you know, from the real ceiling to all the way to the floor, like, you know, like the real floor, like, you know, Mm. 20 stories down. He's not doing that. He's only falling, quote unquote only, but he's only falling like two or three stories. And at the bottom, there's a mat. Does that make sense? Wow. Mm Mm-hmm. So, so he builds this false sort of set, uh, just like Harold Lloyd did. They all they all do the same things. Where when you fall, you're not actually, you know, you know, hanging from, you know, twenty stories, forty stories from the, the bottom, of the floor, right? Right. They're, 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 it's this false percep- perspective. The way right. the camera shot is is making you feel like he's doing that, but the reality is that. So that's that's all part of the special effects that. They tend not to reveal or like to tell people about, you know, because mm. they want all the sense. filmmakers to be like, oh, it's like a magic, how do they do it's that? Ma- you know? It's a magic trick. You don't go it telling is. everyone. Yeah. Absolutely. But that's how they do stuff like that. Um, there was a they went there was a bank, I guess, in some of the scenes, the National Bank. I thought it was interesting from era to era. There was a first National Bank and then the last National Bank. Yeah, that was pretty funny. <laughs> I, mm. I thought that was hysterical. I laughed. Yeah. I, when they opened the first National Bank and she was impressed, I was like, okay. And then when he handed her his, my, the suspense was like killing me. I was like, what is it going to say? Like <laughs> Joe Schmo's <laughs> bank, you know, like mm-hmm. when it said last National Bank, I was like, that's really funny. Yeah. That's, that's very much like you'd expect from Buster Keaton because his, his mechanical wit, you know? mind, you know? Yeah. It's not just the actual gag, but it's also the wit of, yep. you, you know, that, that who he is. When he, uh, I love how there was a scene where in the uh, ancient era where Buster, the character is hitting on this Amazonian woman. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he's like trying to make up the, the, the girl he's chasing jealous, right? Jealous, is right. That call, right? Yep. So he's just like hitting on her and he is like, Da da da, and then finally she stands up and just like 
pummels him and he goes over the the cliff or the yeah. edge some somewhere high. Yep. I love how he mm-hmm. just blows a kiss like bye. <laughs> right. <laughs> goes before it hits the water. <laughs> yeah, a, that was real... uh that was that was the scene where right after, as he was no, no no yeah, no, that's the right scene where he's watching the other guy grab the woman and drag her into the cave by the hair. He tries right. to grab her by the hair and then finds out she's like two feet taller than him. Yeah. Like, but <laughs> I yeah, mean, the, never mind. Yeah, I just go ahead. Oh, nothing. Just that when he falls off the cliff and falls into the water, it's like I don't know. It just didn't. It that one didn't strike me as very creative. But he was blowing a kiss, so I think that's yeah. a, that's a character moment. I think I, I feel like, it, you know, as a set piece and stunts and stuff, you know, it's no more different than what you're used to from him. Especially if you even in that if you're in the twenties and you're watching this movie, you probably would have grown up watching his shorts, and probably some of them were impressive. You've seen right, and you're kind of coming in expecting more. But I, th- I think he is trying to tell a story here, and he is trying to have these character moments and like you said like that jump was nothing interesting but it was a character moment where he yeah. blows a kiss you know and it, it, yes. and he has something more to say i think in this this particular feature than a lot of his other features certainly mm-hmm. that i remember so that might change as i rewatch some of the other ones but <laughs> as far as i've seen uh it, yeah it's it, it's interesting he's got a lot more interesting messages in this one than i originally thought or realized there was a scene here um where i guess when they're duking it out in the in the the caveman age i guess and they're kind of uh they for the the girl's hand or something like that they're they're trying to fight it out right whoever Mm -hmm. wins wins the uh girl and i I found it funny that both of them had entourages (laughs) Hmm. so like the the guy had some couple of guys with them and and so did Buster Keaton. It just just the whole thought mm. of back in the 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 uh, the ancient days, you would have entourages coming along with you for fights. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. It, it's a very modern sort of uh, take on an old story, you know. That juxtaposition, mm-hmm. at least it was funny for me. <laughs> um, let's see. There was also there was a there's a football gag where um, in 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 one of the scenes where was it in the ancient day when they were doing um, they were doing some sports right I know they did the golf thing but they did a football gag too in the ancient ancient or maybe Roman I'm I'm I'm, I'm a little blurry now because it's been a couple of weeks since I, I've seen it. Um, they did the golf scene with the clubs, like literal clubs yeah. for the ancient time. But in the future, the modern one, they were just playing regular football. I don't. That's think what they it really, was. Yes. I mean, just the chariot running <laughs> yeah. with the Roman time. Yes. Okay. I think uh, the reason I brought that up, I was thinking about that, was just because of how so the guy has to prove his medal um, in in the in the ancient era, you know, using some sort of sport or or the the fight sort of to the death thing. And then the the Roman era was the chariot race, right? And then the modern one's just regular sports, you know? It's just again, like that whole motif was really rich. How somehow mm. the the person the guy has to prove his medal right to win the girl, you know? Mm. So I thought that was interesting. Now, yeah. towards the Go ahead. No, I, I was just agreeing with you. I think it's, you know, it's the same mentality, different method per in eras. Yeah, I I yeah, I just thought that was um I I just thought that had sort of a lot of commentary, so, social commentary, I think through all the ages. There was one particular um towards the end of the Roman era where he's about to get the girl and then he, he had a pole vaulting scene. <laughs> there was a really long pole he grabbed it and he just kind of jumped it right into the second floor or something with a long pole mm. you remember that no i do I don't remember that 
Yeah, it was towards the end. It was either no, it's probably I'm sorry, it's the Roman era. The yeah, it was the Roman era where they're sort of on the second level and they're being chased as usual, and then he has he takes his long pole and kind of do a does a pole wall thing. It's another one of the stunts, you know. Hmm. So just like the 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 build, building the the building leaps, so hmm. it, you know he's got all these gags across. So, anyways, that's I'm, that's I'm all I had. Might have looked away at the wrong moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, it, there is a lot of uh, stunts here too, just like any of the shorts. Yeah, but I feel like I said it was, it it all, it it, it was all put together to tell this, these series yeah. of stories, interlinking stories. I thought yep. that was, unique. and I will say that about Buster Keaton in general. Like you know, you to look away for two seconds, you you could miss something. Oh yeah. He's fast. He is. Anyway, anything else? Any last thoughts, parting thoughts about The the Three Ages? It was a, a pretty short film. Well, all in all, all I liked it. It's not my favorite, but I did like it. Yeah, it was entertaining. I think if you were a regular theater go in the uh, 20s, and, you know, you saw another Maquis uh, Buster Keaton title, you would have gone to see it like all of his sh- shorts except this time you're like oh he, this is a feature and it's the one he directed you know <laughs> they may have probably put some publicity around that too you know so so yeah i think um it made its money and stuff like that and that's what re- ultimately allowed him to continue his career you know as a feature director so he, he didn't go back to shorts as far as i know mm. so mm. Anyways, what's uh, interesting is that uh, for a long time, until the 50s, uh, prints of this film were in precarious states. And um, it, uh, it was only rediscovered in 54, and it, the film negative was uh, badly decomposed and almost unsalvageable. So hmm. um, out of all the actual technical quality, this is one of the worst kept ones. So the, there are bits of it that's pretty tough to uh it's sad you know that nobody's found a better print for it even though it was pretty popular and by the way wallace beery was uh richard the lionheart and robin hood the douglas fairbank robin hood that we saw oh that. really yeah. yeah i knew that name sounded familiar and it was so so there you go that's funny that that's where you remember him from when i, I remember well, because we from... we had reviewed it and we talked about it and we we talked right. about him because uh i think you said that he you remember him and he was in some other future series. Yeah, I, or that's where I know him from. I know right. him as the father on the Rockford Files, yeah. Right, there you go. And and that made me curious that he went so far back to silent films and was in a film with Buster Keaton, so. Yeah, sometimes mm-hmm. the, these people have really long careers, you know? Yep. So. Anywho, all right. So, any parting thoughts about this film? I really like Lionel Barrymore. I'd like to find the role that he did in the film. Lionel Barry? Lionel Barrymore. Barrymore. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's uh Did you IMDb him in the film? Yeah. <laughs> I haven't. No, I didn't know. But I will. Like, yeah. Lionel Belmore, right? Barrymore. B L M O R E. Barrymore. Barrymore. Belmore. Ba- Barry, Barry Moore. Mm. Lionel, you, you're not familiar with Lionel Barrymore? I'm just looking up. The he's, a, he's a giant of the screen. He was, um, he was Mr. Potter in It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, not this guy. I, I don't know if you misread the, 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 the cast. I don't think so. It's hard yeah, to I don't see him on IMDb. So there is a guy named Lionel Belmore, B E L M O R E, in an oh. unconfirmed, undetermined role. That's the closest. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? Maybe I did read the mis, 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 yeah, I would misread the characters rewind in the film. and go back because this yeah. guy is more of a character actor, and he's actor and director. He's known for being in bit pieces. Background uh, sets and pieces in Frankenstein, the original, nineteen thirty-one. Uh, uh, all right, that would make sense. All right, I'll I'll double check. Yeah, double check. So, 
Anyway. All right, folks. So there you have it. Three ages. Buster Keaton. Uh, I liked it. Uh, less from the other. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, I think you'll find that Buster Keaton continues to improve it, from the shorts to features. And it will continue to evolve. Because hmm. I think ultimately he, one of his last movies he'll be making is called The Last Cameraman. Hmm. I think, and uh, that's when, essentially, that's kind of when he's done, done. <laughs> so, hmm. mm-hmm. yeah, he did. Um, he he will have gone to do a lot of f- films, um, but the cameraman would would be one of his final hurrahs, as it were. I mean, after the general, w- remember we talked about it, that really bankrupted. Uh, sort of his name and everything and studios and they're less inclined to trust him he did two more um he well under his banner uh the buster keaton productions he did college in steam uh boat bill jr and after that um he would do the cameraman and then spite marriage and that's pretty much it for his directorial for the silent era. He's done more stuff later on, but it's just like, I don't think as, uh, in terms of height of popularity as, as big as the silent era stuff. Mm. Anyways. So that's it for this week's, um, review of, uh, Buster Keaton's, uh, three ages. Um, Mm -hmm. any, any last thoughts, parting words, Lady or Bob? Nope. Nah. That's it. Sounds like a plan. You can find more of our stuff at watchingsilentfilms.wordpress.com. Again, that's watchingsilentfilms.wordpress.com. And please leave a review or star rating on Apple Podcasts or any podcast platform you find us. And uh, this uh, podcast is produced by Lily and edited uh, by Fong. And thank you, everybody. Thanks, listeners. And thanks, Bob and Lee. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Night.